I'm Captain Kirk. Fascinating. <laughs> I'm a doctor, not a mechanic. Thank you, thank you. Love you. Mwah. Most illogical. I saw. Well, that was different. Yep, rousy, but different. Places, please. And here we go. Welcome, welcome, ladies, gentlemen, bears, Ferengi, and things to episode 107 of the Muppet Trek podcast. I'm Steve. That's a great one. And I'm Jarman, and we're here to compare, contrast, and confer about our two favorite franchises. And what are those, Steve? That's the Muppets and Star Trek. We've been doing one-to-one reviews of The Muppet Show, and now Star Trek The Next Generation. And tonight we're covering The Muppet Show with special guest star Debbie Harry and Star Trek The Next Generation episode, The Last Outpost. But before we get into it, Jarman... Do we have some feedback? A little bit here. A a response to our Glenda Jackson episode, which uh, Mm -hmm. Paul Wright from the Cosmic Pizza and Epsilon 3 podcast so graciously graciously gave us uh, info on beforehand. Yeah, thank Uh, you again, Paul. Yeah, he commented after listening. um, He said, uh, uh, I'm glad she did herself proud on the show, kind of in reference to us liking her on the episode. She really did. She did. Really a good episode. And he says, uh, her performance in the movie The Great Escaper is amazing and worthy of an Oscar. So we should probably check that out. The greatest. Maybe she'll win posthumously. It's happened before. Maybe. Oh, that's right. Because that's the new one that just came out with Michael Caine. He was talking about. Yeah, just get Ma- with Michael Caine. Michael Caine. Michael Caine. Michael Caine. So, Steve, first tell us about who is the <laughs> guest star on the Muppet well, Show this week. Debbie Harry was the lead vocalist for the band Blondie, who scored hits such as Heart of Glass, Call Me, and One Way or Another, two of which we get to hear in this episode. She was one of the earliest faces of American punk music, as just as it was struggling to find its foothold in the mainstream. But what does our audience know her from? Well, they have you have heard at least one of her songs, and probably one of the two she performs on this episode. Oh, yeah. If you've listened to the radio in the last 30 years, it's Can probably going to have happened. If you lived on a rock. Or a Nissan commercial, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Possibly. But what's she up to this week on The Moat Show? We're backstage. The Frog Scouts, led by Robin, are there. Uh, they get in everyone's way. They eventually fawn over Debbie Harry and turn into punks, and they all get little frog punk makeovers to earn merit badges. <laughs> uh, Kermit then, in an odd move, like kind of goes and harasses the guest and badgers her into singing Rainbow Connection with him. Uh, Gonzo has to delay his act because the uh, his gorilla didn't show up. The scouts go on. The gorilla shows up, and they like march over him and physically assault him. Uh, on stage, Kermit introduces Debbie Harry. Robin tells Kermit that his whole Frog Scout troop is there. They rush to the stage. Uh, but first we get the opening number. It's Wayne. No Wanda this week. And he sings Me and My Gal as a monstrous hunchback up in the tower above echoes the sentiment singing Me and My, me and my Gargoyle mm-hmm. with, a, with a gargoyle. And even the building joins them in their lovely singing. And the Frog, sna- the frog Scouts show up and start taking pictures. Debbie then hits the stage without her regular band. She makes a note of this and performs one way or another as the sort of Frankenstein hunchback chases her around and also uh, a tiger. It's weird. <laughs> Up next, a young girl sings about her pet beetle who her nanny let out. She's very disappointed and narrowly misses the beetles multiple times until a giant scary beetle shows up and sings with her. Now we get pigs in space uh, where... In a moment of panic, after a hole is punched in the ship, the boys shove boys shove Piggy's face into it, and eventually they dislodge her with a sneeze, and then Link Hogthrob gets stuck. Uh, Kermit introduces the scouts, who come out and do a coordinated marching drill kind of effort until a gorilla comes out, and as I mentioned, they physically assault him. <laughs> Finally, Debbie hits the stage one more time and performs Call Me with her punk band uh, behind her in a scaffolding lit rock concert sort of scenario. Kermit thanks Debbie Harry one last time. She is made an honorary Frog Scout. Uh, Kermit better have the Frog Scout's money. And that is what we call the Muppet Show. She looked adorable in that Scout outfit, so Jeremy, by the way. What did you think of this week's episode with Debbie Harry? I think it was a perfectly serviceable and entertaining episode. Uh, Debbie Harry performed, as you said, two of her biggest hits, uh, but with the Muppets, different kinds of Muppets. And I, I enjoyed her singing Rainbow Connection with Kermit. It was nice having the harmonies there, which is pretty cool. Made it really pretty to listen to. Um, I am definitely biased, I must say, because I had a huge crush on Debbie Harry growing up. Um, I used to watch her music videos on MTV because they play old ones and on VH1. Like I'd watch her old music videos. I thought she was just so sexy and 
So she is. I mean, come on. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I even got to see her in concert in Atlanta back when I lived there. When wow. um, So she was still great up to this point. Um, but yeah, we had great pigs in space sketch, which I liked. And the, and the Boy Scout troop with Robin were really cute. Um, the only thing dragging this down a little bit was I think what the, the warning in the beginning of the episode was is kind of implying that the hunchback was kind of mentally challenged. And that was kind of offensive and kind of weird. See, I, I read him as like a Frankenstein's monster. Yeah, it was weird because of how they fashioned him. They did make him look more like Frankenstein's monster, but he was very heavily implied. He was like the hunchback of Notre Dame. And like my my wife was leaving for the for the morning and she just kind of was seeing what I was watching. And she's like, first of all, that's really offensive. And also, that's not how he's portrayed in the book. And I'm like, I know it's very something's wrong here. Um, but overall, I think uh, for me, anyways, very middling to high, high middling episode because it was entertaining and stuff throughout what do you think See, this this is gonna probably fall low middling to low for me okay and here's why debbie harry i do not think related well to the muppets and for the most part actually kind of avoided really into the muppets in that you know her two big numbers one of them she didn't really interact with anyone that's true she literally like the band was just there and the other one she just ran around stage and looked through doors and had to like run away scared but she wasn't like acting with the Muppets. She was just doing her normal shtick. I think because she's not much of an actress, which is fair. But well, also, yeah. <laughs> so here's my other review. Um, I don't. I'm not here to judge anyone, but I'm pretty sure Debbie Harry was high as shit for probably, this whole thing. You mean through the whole '80s, probably <laughs> through all the '80s. So she was high as shit, and you could re- you could really see it. You could see she was kind of dazed and confused and didn't know where to look and her eyes would go wide occasionally for no reason it was <laughs> yeah um so she was high as shit and so because i think that was probably a barrier between her and the muppets a little bit <laughs> um so it, it, lower middling just because i don't think she related well she was clearly high out of her mind and then you add to that to the fact that we only get one real kind of regular sketch in the whole thing it's like meh yeah that's true and i i you know I just I am biased because I had a huge crush on her, but yeah, no, and that's I, fair. I, I do that's see fair. your nostalgia point. counts. I nostalgia do see your counts. points. Absolutely, the lo- logic of your points make a lot of sense. So, what about the songs yeah. in this episode, sir? The music this week for me and my gal, which me and my gargoyle, uh, <laughs> first hit the scenes in 1917, but it became wildly popular when it was used in a 1942 film of the same name, which starred Judy Garland and Gene Kelly. Me and my gal. Hmm. Uh, one way or another, from Blondie, uh, funnily enough, the band's original name was Angel and the Snake. <laughs> really? I didn't know yeah. that. Uh, Forgiven, which is the, better known as the Alexander Beatles song. That, that song is actually called Forgiven. Uh, it's based on a poem by A.A. A. Milne, who is better known for writing the Winnie the Pooh books. Oh, yeah. Uh, and then Rainbow Connection by Paul Williams. We've talked about it before. Written for the Muppet movie. And it's, of course, of classic. It actually hit number 25 on the Billboard Top 100 when it released. Very nice. Uh, And then Call Me, also Blondie. Uh, This song was originally tagged for Stevie Nicks of Fleetwood Mac. But due to some, like, political struggles between the studios, they weren't able to give it to her. And so then it got handed to Blondie and became one of her biggest hits. Oh, I did. So they didn't write it at all. It was just given to them. That's not very punk at all. (laughs) Well, Debbie Harry wasn't Debbie Harry was like the 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 like acceptable version of punk that could come into your front living room. Yeah, the pop culture version. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's the thing. She was the face of punk at a time when it was struggling to find that foothold and really was a pioneer in that way. She was the punk music that people knew. Right. She kind of made it um, acceptable. Made it more acceptable and opened that gate, but at the same time she, compared to like punk music now and through its heyday. Not much. <laughs> nah, nah. Jordan, what do you think was the best Muppeteering moment this week? Um, I had probably give it to the one way or another Blondie number, even though I do agree she was just kind of like, ooh, opening my mouth when I get scared by a Muppet. But it was just the coordination by the Muppeteers and the set building where they had to open all these doors and come out with the music at the right time. And um, that just probably took a lot of effort. And it was just kind of uh, oh, it, it worked out. Why really couldn't well. that have been the electric mayhem? Good point. It very well could that have. That made me, that was, I forgot to bring that up while you were talking about it. Why couldn't that have been the electric mayhem? That would have been so much better if that was the electric mayhem. <laughs> and why not, right? Yeah. And why not? That's a good point. I don't know why. Bullshit. What about you? 
I'm going to give it to the one sort of shining light in this episode, which is that Pigs in Space, which was genuinely good. Yes. And for I know that both Piggy and Link Hogthrob got sucked in, but for some reason, Jim Henson as Link Hogthrob feels like he really went for it. <laughs> really shoved that face in that hole hard. And so because of that, I'm going to give it to Link Hogthrob being sucked into that hole. You just like that getting and sucked Pigs into in that space. hole, don't you? That's what you I like. I do. About. And Piggy's didn't do it for me. It wasn't until Link Hogthrob... <laughs> Got his meaty head in there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I know what I'm saying. <laughs> Put that pork in that hole. Oh, yeah. Bam. <laughs> That's terrible. That's why there's uh, always so an adults only uh, on this episode, on these episodes That's every right. time. Because you never know when we're going to spill it. It just comes out. If sometimes. anything, it's probably at our detriment. Exactly. Really, we really we do a kid's podcast. That's really what we do. <laughs> Pretty Until we say something like that. And then it's not. Yeah. Uh, it's X-rated. Oh, yeah. Um, all right, so, Jordan, what happened on this week's episode of Star Trek The Next Generation? <laughs> so, unfortunately, this week we have The Last Outpost, which is, uh, I think, episode five, episode four, or something like that of uh, Next Generation. So, mm-hmm. the Enterprise is chasing after a Ferengi vessel after they stole an energy converter from a Federation outpost. And at this point, the Federation knows nothing about the Ferengi, but they uh, they but they but know, know about them, but they, don't, they never made contact with them before. And as their chase brings them near this strange planet, both of their ships are suddenly drained of power and they stop in place and they're slowly losing ship systems as all the power is being drained from their ships. But initially, the Enterprise thinks that this unknown uh, Ferengi vessel must have some powerful technology and that they're the ones draining the Enterprise. And the Ferengi are thinking the same thing of the Enterprise. And once they figure out that neither of them are doing it, uh, Picard convinces the Ferengi with his great diplomatic skills to go down to the planet with them to figure out what is causing this before both ships lose life support and they all die. Why they didn't just use escape pods and shuttles to get off the ships, I have no idea. They just don't bring it up. It's strange. Uh, (laughs) Once on the planet, though, uh, Data figures out that this planet used to be part of something called the Takan Empire that was destroyed by their star going supernova 600,000 years ago. And once they all find each other on the planet, the dumb Ferengi ambush the Enterprise away team, claiming they thought the away team was going to ambush them first. And the away team eventually gets free, though, and is uh, about to phaser stun the Ferengi. But their weapon fire is absorbed by the nearby rocks because apparently the planet is going into overdrive and starting to absorb more and more power. So the ships are really in danger now. Then this entity awakens and it calls itself Portal 63 for some reason and says it is a guardian of the Takan Empire. It asks them if they are trying to enter the Takan Empire, but then it gets confused when Data tells him that the Takan Empire was destroyed a long, long time ago. And for some reason, the Ferengi then tell Portal 63 that the Enterprise crew are a hostile force, and they force their will on the galaxy, and they don't help those that are in need. And for some reason as well, Riker decides not to deny any of this, and offers no defense for himself and the others, inexplicably. This causes Portal 63 to attack Riker, but right before he does, Riker says, fear is the true enemy, only the only enemy. And he doesn't flinch when Portal 63 strikes at him with a a huge halberd. And this convinces Portal 63 that the Enterprise crew are actually civilized and the Ferengi are the ones that are, are barbarians and he doesn't want to kill them anymore. So he starts talking to Riker about the art of war uh, by Lao Tzu, I think it's pronounced uh, something that he had scanned from the Enterprise's computer earlier he then asks Riker if he wants him to destroy the Ferengi vessel, but Riker declines and says, how how would they then learn? So Portal 63 stops the energy drain on their ships. The Ferengi return the Federation energy converter, and then Riker has Chinese finger traps beamed over to the Ferengi ship because they are annoying and Data was playing with one earlier. And that is um, the last outpost. Steve, what do you think of this episode? Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. 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 I would, I would have loved to have been in the production room, like in the writer's room for this one. Because they're like, all right, it's the Ferengi, right? We set them up two episodes ago as like the main opposition to the Federation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like big, intimidating force. Federation's going to have to deal with them. Big political conflict. All right, cool, cool. And they're like technologically almost on the same level. Yeah, almost the same. Maybe a little bit different. But definitely they're shrewd businessmen mm. and merchants. Traders. Yeah, yeah. And, and they're like, okay, cool, cool, cool. And Sandra, uh, how do you think they should act? I think like like little rat men. Uh, so, <laughs> so in way, so in way. take a, a juvenile yeah. monkey, mix it with a rat, and then you got it. 
<laughs> Someone went, yeah, just like that. That's exactly how <laughs> these equally technologically advanced shrewd business ventured act, like little rat monkey men. Formidable like villains the for thing. the empire, for the federation. <laughs> and, then some, and then they handed that to exec and some exec said yes. Perfect. <laughs> but man, what a misfire on the Ferengi. Oh my God. What yeah. a misfire on the Ferengi. Any chance of us now taking the Ferengi seriously, like basically for the rest of the show, is gone. <laughs> it's gone. So that that's bad for them. And then a second episode where we run into some alien race who's like, Oh, you let your women wear clothing? <laughs> As a rat monkey man, that disgusts me. <laughs> it's like, what? What is happening? Stop it. Who is writing these things? <laughs> you Texas dick off. <laughs> yeah, I think it was a painful episode to watch. Um, I I had remember seeing this. I didn't remember a lot of it. I remember, of course, them acting like complete imbeciles. These these Ferengi were just terribly portrayed. Um, but I just didn't remember like the Portal sixty three guy. I didn't remember at all. And just the writing was really bad still. I'm like, wow, is this the same show that I grew to love so much? And yes, it is. But we thankfully are getting – this is also on the top five worst episodes of the whole series right, list. So, okay, so we're so we're back in the writer's room. They're like, all right, all so right. then there's this weird alien guy who's going to show up. And he's like, yeah, he's going to show up. He's going to be all disfigured. Yeah, he's going to be all, all messed up. We'll get the makeup department to do that. Uh, should we give him like a like a crazy alien name? Like we have a laundry list, like Gar, Gar Pax and <laughs> – Four near and, and the guys like no no we're just gonna call him Portal sixty three. Well, what the does that like, mean? What what does that what does that mean? He's like, but we have but that's not like an, that's not a name. That's like a you sure? What I mean? And he's like just write it down. But where are the other sixty two portals? Like what, write it what, down. Is he a portal or a it's man? It's gonna create mystery. <laughs> and that guy's name was J J Abrams. It was a mystery and box. And <laughs> scene. Um. Just once again, just misfires across the board on this episode. I'm so glad to hear it's in the bottom five. I know. I'm glad my instinct is good. I liked Code of Honor more was. than this. Like, for sure. Code of Honor was better than this episode. And Code of Honor was terrible, but this was real I know. bad. I think this one takes it because at least this one had like an interesting alien setting to look at. We did get a look at the Ferengi, which was set up as a big race. We got to see some different tech. Like, I think this one had more interest for the Star Trek universe. As I a guess whole. they were making a bigger swing and they just they did miss really bad, but they made a bigger swing at least. I guess. Like, was- do we ever hear from those other aliens again? No, <laughs> no. But the Ferengi show up a bunch of times, right? Yes, but in a much better way go. in the future. That's the win. See, they, that's the win. They refine the Ferengi much better after this. And so am I wrong? Yeah. But are a bunch of the actors who played Ferengi here also actors that played Ferengi later Ol- in later incarnations? Uh, only one of them plays a regular. One of them that played in this episode does end up being Cork, like a main character in um, D Space Nine, but he's a plays a totally different Ferengi. Yeah, and the yeah, other yeah. two apparently do show up as bit parts as Ferengi later on as well. Okay, because I was like, I looked at them, I was like, I think those are them, but maybe I'm just being racist against Ferengi. <laughs> you can kind of tell Quark's voice if you're a watcher of Deep Space Nine for one of these guys, but the rest of them, the other two are just like smaller bit part roles later on. Um, but yeah, so whew, I think this might not be my least favorite episode of the season, maybe the whole series, we'll see, but it's so so far the worst of the season. Well, for would me. you say that you that that next generation is you're much more up to date on it? What do you mean? Like what? Which which one of the series have you like watched the most recently? I mean, I went back. Like I would when I'm sitting there editing for hours on audiobooks a long time ago. I'd sit there and just put uh, Next Generation on the background. I've watched episodes for podcasts to review them for like right. other. So I mean, I've watched the most Next Generation of any of the series probably. Okay. Um. Yeah. Well, good. It's yeah, it's definitely my favorite, uh, but the other ones are really good too. Like watching all of Deep Space Nine is really fun to do. And I, mean, I hear Deep Space Nine from people over and over and over again because it has like the easiest like through line stories, and so I think people like that a lot, especially more and modern. I'm so audiences. excited that we're doing it next after we get through Next Generation. Yeah, we'll be like in our early fifties. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, it's gonna be a lot. <laughs> If we have what? How many seasons of Next Generation to go through? Just seven. Only seven seasons. But we've been through the equivalent of like four seasons already of shows, and so you know we're getting through them. That's true. We are keeping a good pace. 
Yeah. Uh, but it's going to be a long road, folks. I hope you wear comfy pants. Strap in. So here's some <laughs> trivia for this episode. As I mentioned, this is the first Star Trek appearance of Armin Shimmerman as the Ferengi officer Latek. Um, Shimmerman would later on to play Quark, the Ferengi bartender in Deep Space Nine. And according to nice. Armin Shimmerman, the actors playing the Ferengi were directed to jump up and down like crazed gerbils. So you're pretty close. But they were directed to do that, which is ridiculous. Uh, this episode marks the first appearance of the Ferengi. The initial idea was for them to be portrayed as hostile and aggressive throughout the entire series. However, the Ferengi were eventually used more and more for comic relief throughout this and following Star Trek series after fans thought that this role suited them better. Yes, it does. Um, Armin Shimmerman said of his performance, I was pretty much playing an over-the-top villain that turned out to be very comical. I thought I was being serious, but obviously it was not serious. It was, it's because there was no subtlety to the performance. There was no attempt to try to give them some real uh, cojones. It was bad acting. It was just bad acting. They liked it. God bless them. Star Trek liked it. That's what he said. <laughs> so, he thought he was ba badly acting in that episode. Also, any friends of Buffy out there, he plays the principal in, in season one and two, I believe, of Buffy. Uh, so oh, there you go. yeah, I remember him. Um, one of only two Star Trek productions where the Ferengi use energy whips, these ridiculous energy whips they oh have. Oh, my God. The other is the episode Acquisition of Star Trek Enterprise, which was uh, the last appearance of them before the new Trek episodes came out. So energy whips only appear in the very first and very last Ferengi episodes ever made until Star Trek Discovery and all the rest of those shows. So they come back later on, mm. which is nice. One of a few times in TNG that a swear word is used uh, when the Enterprise fails to pull away from the planet, Captain Picard says "mird," which is French for shit. Um, since it was a foreign language, it slipped past the censors, so it's pretty cool. Uh, and Riker's notion of sending Chinese finger traps to the Ferengi vessel at the end of the episode was a reference to the trouble with Tribbles, uh, where Scotty beams over a shipload of Tribbles to the Klingon ship at the end of the episode. Ah, okay. Nice. Yeah, nice little reference there. So, Steve, what are our Trek Connection Muppet Connections this time around? Well, Debbie Harry has actually done a fair amount of acting really? in her life. Bit roles here or there, appearances in movies, that sort of thing. And Debbie Harry was in the movie version of Tales from the Dark Side. Also in this movie was Christian Slater, whose mother was a casting agent who got him a small role in Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country. That's right. Where he's like, he, he like shows up at a door and tells Sulu something, I think. He's also killed, I believe, and by Cleons. Maybe. It gets a lot of a pink blood in that scene, which is weird. Uh, and then Debbie Harry also did a part uh, in the star-studded uh, TV special Mother Goose Rock and Rhyme, which had many musicians and famous actors in it at the time, including Shelley Duvall. In this also was Terry Garr, who was in the season two, the original series episode, Assignment Earth, which ended up being a failed spinoff for an entirely other show that didn't work out. That's right. She played like a transformer. So Debbie cat. Harry and, and Terry Gar were both in Mother Goose's Rock and Rhyme. And Terry Gar also is a Catwoman, I believe, wasn't she? One of the Catwomen? Eh, maybe. I don't think so. That doesn't sound right, but maybe. Maybe, maybe not. But it's basically the same episode. Uh, basically the same. Both have something happening outside of the cast control. Uh, so two forces must join together to achieve a common goal. That's with the Ferengi and the Enterprise to shut down the mm -hmm. planet's power over them and the Muppet Show crew and Robin's Boy Scouts to make the show go on because the gorilla didn't like show up in time. <laughs> uh, both feature fierce negotiations, the Ferengi and the Enterprise over what to do on the planet and Mrs. Appleby and Kermit in regards to the scouts getting paid. Oh, that is some fierce negotiations. That's true. Uh, both have a spaceship losing oxygen, the Enterprise losing life support systems and the Swine Trek getting a hole in its hull. <laughs> both feature the regular crew having to deal with a small small strange energetic race the away team dealing with the rat like Ferengi <laughs> and the crew dealing with the frog scouts underfoot oh that's true that's true uh, yeah. both have someone going missing from their home the Takan Empire from all their planets in Star Trek <laughs> and the beetle from its matchbox in the Muppet show <laughs> nice <laughs> yes okay <gasps> oh, what's the noise order now function Transporter malfunction. Okay, it's the part of the show where we transport one character from one episode to the other, and then vice versa. What you got for us, Steve? This week, Trek to Muppets, I'm going to bring over the Ferengi and replace Debbie Harry's band, all of them playing weird futuristic instruments and in-between takes eventually getting cool punk makeovers. Oh, yeah. 
I also see them like straightening out their whips and like playing their their fusion whip things. Yeah, <laughs> and one of them has a pink mohawk for some reason. Yes, and like hair and like like studs around his big ears. Yeah, uh, trekked him up. It's I'm gonna have Mrs. Appleby and the Frog Scouts to come over to replace the Ferengi. Uh, they'd be so much more likable and friendly, and they would make an excellent contribution to the United Federation of Planets. <laughs> yeah, they're just there underfoot, so excited. Hey, we're here on the ship. It's fun. <laughs> uh, Muppets of Trek, I'm going to bring over the hunchback monstrosity and replace Portal 63. They both just all be deformed and benevolent whatnot. <laughs> I like it. Because I'm also replacing Portal 63, but with Debbie Harry. It would be, be great if she popped out at the end of the episode just to do a musical just number. High, just high as shit. Hey, guys, up. what happened to the Takan Empire, man? Come on, be cool. Come be cool. Where is it? Where is, where's the Empire? Where'd it go? Where'd it go? <laughs> Call me. All right, I'll see you guys later. I'll see you later. Your ships are dying. I don't care. See you later. <laughs> so that brings us to the end of episode 107 of the Muppet Trek Podcast. Join us next time for The Muppet Show with special guest Jean-Pierre Rampal. And the Next Generation episode where no one has gone before. So from the lovers, the dreamers, and us. Live long and prosper, everyone. Thanks for listening to The Muppet Trek Podcast. Be sure to follow us on social media on Facebook and Twitter. Subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, or your favorite podcast platform. This podcast has been brought to you by A Play on Nerds. <laughs>